No, the reaction of the Victorian authorities that uh, at best can be described as slow. Uh, they they started the the previous month by releasing the latest crime statistics, which they uh, spun as you know Victoria was becoming uh, safer. Which although the overall uh, crime rate had reduced, this was due to uh, massive drops in crimes such as arson. The violent crimes that you know people are worried about are actually. Uh, increased and when these uh, cri crimes started to happen this month, they they first said it was uh, just a, a youth problem. Yeah, no. See, I don't really buy that narrative. The idea that it's a yes, a youth problem. Um, I mean, if you look at uh, figures which have been released by the Victorian Police Force, this is based on 2015 data. Apparently, Sudanese migrants are 44 times more likely to break the law and 70 times more likely to commit a home invasion. Now, those are statistics which have been released by the Victorian Police Force. Um, I mean, obviously, if it's, you know, common knowledge, it's publicly available. I don't think you can really look at that and then say, oh, well, it's a youth problem. No, it's not a youth problem. It's a Sudanese problem. Okay, these are people who are from a third world country who have a radically different culture who, are, who we are actively importing into our country. You don't have to be a genius to figure this out. If you import a whole bunch of Australians to a country, Australians obviously like shall we say, drinking beer or playing sport. That's going to alter the culture in the country in which we go to. You probably have more beer consumption and more of a sport-focused culture. You could look at Indians, for example. Indians, uh, when we think of you know, an Indian stereotype, maybe they like eating curry, they like playing cricket. If Indians immigrate to a country, you're going to have that host nation which they've gone to is probably going to have more curry consumption or more people watching or playing cricket. Likewise, if you have people from a third-world country where rape and murder and violence are normalised, and you import those people into your country, you don't have to be a genius to figure out what's going to happen. Now, as I said before, we have these statistics to back this up. Um, you, you can't really deny statistics. Um, I don't think you really need to be a genius to figure out what is at the core of this problem. It's not youths, okay? It's not young people. It's not the fact that they are young. It's the fact that they are from a part of the world where this culture is normalised. Now, I don't want to live in a country where that culture is normalised, so I, for one, am willing to call this for what it is, and I would hope that other people would be um, brave enough and have enough common sense to do the same thing. Then the Victorian government and Victoria Police, they said it was an African youth problem, but uh, don't call them gangs because, you know, that will uh, incentivize them somehow to uh, commit uh, more crimes, even though it was, you know, they, they'd been... The graffiti had, you know, apex and uh, menace to society on it. Like, they, they are a gang, so, so what else are you, are you meant to call it? Well, exactly. Um, I mean, in my experience, they don't even um, they don't even have the courage to do any of this um, individually. They would never attack anyone one on one. They always want to go after people ten on one. Um, yeah, no, it is a gang issue. It's not individuals. They hunt in packs. Uh, and once again, this is clearly a uh, an aspect of their culture. And as much as uh, certain segments of the media and the government and whoever else want to push this idea of diversity and cultural enrichment. I'm pretty sick of it, quite frankly. I'm sick of the cultural enrichment. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm not really enjoying the, um, I suppose, the um, consequences of these sorts of policies. So I think it, um, for people to be pushing this narrative, to be pushing this idea that this is somehow enriching for Australia, I think it's about time we pointed out that the emperor has no clothes, that this is a failed policy, that we're not being enriched. Okay, these people are not improving our country. As I said before, they are 44 times more likely to break the law and 70 times more likely to commit home invasions than non-Sudanese immigrants. Um, clearly, that suggests to me that these people are a problem. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I, you know, I would like to think that there is some sort of um, humanitarian aspect in regards to helping people who are from a war-torn country, but I can only be sympathetic up to a certain point. I think that when you um, start rolling out the... Uh, you know, the red carpet for people to come to your country and they then disrespect your laws and your culture and your way of life. They start committing home invasions, carjackings, rapes, murders, whatever else. I think that's when you've got to start to draw the line. So as far as I'm concerned, um, we've got to call this for what it is. We've got to be realistic about this and we've got to try to solve the problem. The problem here is Sudanese immigration. Let's just call it for what it is. Let's not, you know, dance around that. This is one particular group of people who are you know, actively engaging in a certain type of behaviour. Now, if you want to reduce the likelihood of that sort of behaviour occurring, you've got to 
pinpoint where it's coming from. And it's coming from one particular community within Melbourne. And of course, we, we got there in the end from the government and the police who said they are dealing with uh, African street gangs and their rhetoric uh, increased significantly. They said that they want to, you know, see these, you know, violent uh, offenders, you know, locked up and, you know, describe their crimes as horrific. But we are still, you know, lacking leadership during this, you know, crucial time because both the Premier Daniel Andrews and Deputy Premier uh, James Molino are on holidays. The uh, police Commissioner uh, Graham Ashton, he's still on uh, stress leave. So we have the, the acting uh, Chief Commissioner Shane Patton, who from what I he uh, hear from um, uh, uh, police association figures is is actually uh, you know an, an okay uh, type person, but they the apex they you know the the Moomba um, you know uh, fight or you know even if you want to call it right that happened in I think it was about March. Uh, 2016. So this has been uh, a problem for for nearly t nearly two years. Yet it seems that the Victorian government they've been too busy, you know, uh, trying to pursue their you know politically correct social justice, you know, virtue signalling agenda. Meanwhile, uh, meanwhile the uh, you know the safety of the state. I mean, I remember reporting on the beginning of the year, Daniel Andrews had his you know anti-racism uh, police force, which is. And, and at the same time, we're seeing, um, you know, all these, uh, you know, uh, patriot activists charged uh, following the, the the Milo clash. It seems they're, you know, they're they're more interested in going after, you know, people they view as, you know, evil, you know, right wingers rather than the people who are actually committing the violent crimes. Yes. Well, interestingly, if you look at um, if you look at this from a political strategist point of view, I would argue that there is largely a quite a perverse incentive which exists for the Andrews government and I suppose the Labor Party more broadly. I mean, this is a, a, a party or a, a political ideology which is uh, obviously attracts votes based on people voting for bigger government. They're going to vote for welfare and handouts and whatever else. Obviously, they can see that this particular community, based on their background, is more likely to uh, vote for their particular ideology. So it's in their best interest for people from this part of the world to keep on being actively recruited or imported into Australia. So for the Andrews government to push this rhetoric about, oh, you know, anti-racism and whatever else, I think we've got to be realistic about this. This is obviously a guy who realises that if he doesn't win elections, he doesn't have a job. Um, I think he can obviously see that this is a demographic which is more likely to vote for his particular party, and therefore there really is quite, as I said, quite a perverse incentive which exists there. He's obviously less likely to... Um, crack down on this issue, he's less likely to uh, pursue more uh, more of a you know realistic sort of a, a discourse in relation to it. And I think that we really need to do to I suppose do more to uh, call out politicians who won't um, who won't name the elephant in the room. And in this case, you can really see that the Andrews government has dropped the ball there. Um, so as I said, I, I think you've got to look at this um, from that broader uh, political point of view, and you've got to see. I suppose you've got to look at the, the incentives which are motivating the Andrews government to behave in this way. Oh, well, it's the, the it's a state election uh, year with the um, uh, state election due in November, uh, last Saturday in November, and you know, uh, Andrews government backbenchers are getting nervous uh, about, about this issue, and uh, you know they're they're wanting the the premier to uh, to take action, and you know when when you get close to election time, you know self interest uh, you know rules the day, and so if um, you know da uh, Daniel Andrews is you know pressured to you know drop this you know politically correct approach to government, uh, he he will do that. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, I think he's obviously an opportunist. The man is a career politician. If you look at his resume, he spent, I believe, six years in university before becoming a political staffer and then becoming a politician, I think, by the time he was in his late 20s or early 30s. So the man has never had a real job in his entire life. All he knows is politics. He can't do anything else. Realistically, if you have a, um, I suppose, any sort of career which is reliant on um, a certain social phenomenon, you're obviously going to create a, as I mentioned before, a perverse incentive. So from the Daniel Andrews perspective, I suppose, from the perspective of a career politician who is reliant on, um, uh, shall we say, less productive members of society voting for him, I think that there is very much that uh, that incentive or that motivation for him to 
appeal to this particular segment of the community. This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment, and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.